Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Whenever I say have a seat, I am reminded of Jewish custom. In Jesus' day, the teacher sat and the people stood. So you guys are fortunate. <laughs> if you have a Bible, open it with me to the book of Acts, chapter 26. Acts 26. Do you all know what a tempest is? <laughs> Terry points at herself. <laughs> there are some people that are attentive. <laughs> it is a fierce, raging storm. We're going to get into that this morning. I, um, I, love, I, I love Brian's illustrations. <laughs> and I, I was daydreaming yesterday. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could have somebody up here with a great big fan and then somebody with a bucket of water and every now and then just... <laughs> spray you all with water so you can really get the feel what these guys are going through as we, as we get into the text this morning. What's that? Oh, yeah, that would, that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love this chapter. And, and you know, we're only going to get so far in Acts 27, where we look at the actual storm, the tempest, that, that it just gets crazy for Paul and the guys he's with, the people on the ship. Uh, but I want to back up a little bit first and, and just take a look at some stuff that Brian covered last week and just revisit the last section here in Acts 26 as we get started. As you know, context is everything. We want to understand the context of what gets him to this ship and this So. Paul had been in Caesarea for two years under house arrest. Uh, he'd been on trial. He stood first before uh, Felix and then Governor Festus, and now King Agrippa and his incestuous sister wife Bernice. <laughs> She's a, uh, she was a, an interesting person, <laughs> as Brian mentioned. Not going to go down all of the things that she was involved in, but she was, definitely had some issues. So Paul here in Caesarea, in the amphitheater, he's giving his third and longest defense in the book of Acts. Uh, now, a couple of weeks ago, too, I, I just want to touch on something. When we looked at, uh, in Matthew chapter 10, we looked at discussing that we are as sheep that are sent out among wolves. Jesus had some specific Here, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, don't worry about how or, how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it's not you who speaks, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Interesting, because Paul's defense here clearly had been spirit-led uh, as he began to recount his former manner of life in Judaism. Remember, uh, one who had determined to take down Christianity. He was against, violently against the church. He had believers in prison, voted for their execution, angry, self-righteous men. He'd made it his personal mission to travel from city to city throughout the region and search out, persecute believers, attempting to destroy their lives, forcing them, if possible, to blaspheme the name of Christ. Then, then on that day that he shared, on the road to Damascus, on his way to round up some of those Christians there, had papers from the council in Jerusalem, bring them back, we'll take care. Everything changed. Seeing a light brighter than the sun, he says, falling to the ground, he'd heard the voice of Jesus himself saying, Saul, that was his uh, Hebrew name, Aramaic name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not why are you persecuting these people, why are you per persecuting me? You want to know something? Jesus takes it personal. Very much so. So he goes on, he, he goes on to Damascus, a changed man, 
Ananias, and Jesus goes on to outline upon Paul's life from that day forward, telling him he would bear the name of Jesus before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Now, I have to believe that as Paul spoke to uh, Festus and Agrippa and Bernice, uh, that he had an experiential knowledge of the love of God which had been poured out on his life after all that he had stood against and done to other people. If God could save him, there would be no doubt in Paul's mind that God the immoral tyrants that he stood before in this moment. Uh, remember, he is wanting to reach these people with the gospel. That's his, he's not trying to defend himself and say, hey, let me go. He could have done that all along. But he knows that there's a greater call, a greater mission, a greater message that he must convey to the people than, hey, you know, somebody post bail. <laughs> Get me out of here. So as he testified there, uh, again, at the amphitheater, Caesarea, all the pomp, uh, the group of all the dignitaries, and the king and his wife, and, and Festus, uh, <laughs> the words that he had spoken, uh, as we look at this, I mean, we know that the scripture is inspired, but I also believe that Paul was very much inspired at this time, because the words that he had spoken were not his own. Just as Jesus had said, Back there in Matthew chapter 10, he was speaking under the authority of the Holy Spirit. And the conviction of God's Spirit had come upon Festus as he spoke. His response had been to immediately reject Paul's words. Ah, I don't want to hear about that, Paul. You're nuts. In doing so, Festus was rejecting not Paul, but Jesus himself. Verse 24 in Acts 26. Now, as he had thus made his said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Brian talked about that last week. It was essentially their way of saying, Paul, you're nuts. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're beside yourself. You're mad. You're, much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I'm not mad. Most noble Festus speaks to him politely and, and as you would a day. Uh, but I speak the words of truth and of reason. And folks, nobody's going to pet you on the head when you're sharing the love of Christ with them. I mean, there are times where people get aggressive and they get even hostile. Understand it's yours to speak words of truth and reason. Leave the results to God. Leave that alone. Don't feel all rejected if they reject you. Bluster you and men revile you, cast insults at you, say all manner of evil against you falsely on account of me. That's what's going on here. Uh, verse, uh, I lost my place here. <laughs> so Paul says, I speak words of truth and reason. And, and, and he might as well be saying, Festus, I have, this is the most reasonable and sane thing I have ever spoken. There's nothing unreasonable. There's nothing untrue about it. Verse 26, for the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. I, I love that. This wasn't done in a corner. We're not doing things in secret. I love what John says, I believe it's in 1 John, where he says, walk in the light as he is in the light. We don't do this. This isn't a secret society. We want people to know the love of God. And, and, and folks, there are times where, hey, if it takes shouting it from the rooftops, that's what we're going to do. Interesting, too, uh, there was a secular first century Jewish historian named Flavius Josephus. You, many of you have heard of him. He wrote a great volume of information, uh, several books. Uh, now, uh, as I was studying this, it came to light that actually King Agrippa helped Josephus when he was writing the book called The Wars of the Jews. As soon as it was finished, we're told that Josephus t tells us, that he sent Agrippa a copy of the book. He got one of the first copies. In, in, there, in that book, he tells us that Agrippa had written to him no less than 62 times. Here's the point. Agrippa, as Paul says, he was very well versed 
and what was going on in this part of the world. Now remember, it was his great-grandfather, that Herod the Great, that had slaughtered the innocents when Jesus was born in Bethlehem there. It was his great-uncle was the one that had killed John the Baptist. The Herods were a, a, a lineage of pretty wicked rulers. Uh, his own father had killed James the apostle, tried to kill Peter uh, before his own violent death here in Caesarea, being eaten by worms. The point is, this family, uh, Idumeans, which was a, a, a province below Judea, I, they were from this region, and Agrippa knew what was going on. He understood the Jews. He knew of the birth of Christ, the ministry of Christ. He knew of the ministry of John the Baptist. He knew of the miracles. He knew of the crucifixion. He knew now of the rumors of Jesus' resurrection. All of this was familiar to him, and Paul knew it as he stood before him. So Paul continues, as he continues to speak with uh, the force of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it's interesting here because Paul flips the script. <laughs> now it is he who is questioning the king. Paul is now, in a sense, putting Agrippa on the stand. I love that he turns it around. Verse 27, he says, King Agrippa, do you now believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian, Paul. So now scholars differ on what Agrippa's response, what, what was his intention as he makes this comment, you almost, almost persuade me to become a Christian. Was he being derisive with Paul and saying, yeah, okay, well, you know, almost, to Paul, <laughs> good luck with that. You know, good luck with persuading me. Or was he serious? Don't know. Was he stating, look, I, I'm not quite there. We don't know, but we do know this, almost. That word is, is a word, that one word is what will determine Agrippa's eternal destiny. So <laughs> I got a question. Yeah, how much value is there in almost winning the lottery? <laughs> how secure are you in knowing that the parachute almost opened? What does it mean when your wife says, I'm almost ready? <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> Generally, that means we're going to be a while. <laughs> she went to the store, so I can say that. <laughs> Here's the point. <laughs> There's no such thing as an almost Christian. And folks, if you're out there and you're talking with people, you're interacting with people in the world, you come up, there are people, and I, there are absolutely, there are a lot of people that are deists out there. Oh, I believe in God. Oh, of course I do. Well, that's not enough. The Bible tells us the demons believe, and they shudder. You have to do business with Jesus. You have to do business with the cross. You have to put your faith, your trust in him. Uh, you're either sold out wall to wall for Jesus Christ, or quite simply, you're not. Now, remember Brian's exhortation last week, uh, blindness is a choice. Absolutely true. So is, uh, excuse me, so is sight. You know, I love that. He was showing us that we choose, people choose spiritual blindness. And, and there are times where you're dealing with people, they don't want to know. They don't want to hear it. Might as well put their fingers in their ears and, and shout, la, 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 la. But also sight is a choice. Lord, I want to know. Open my heart. Open my understanding. Give me ears to hear. That's why Jesus said over and over and over again, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has eyes to see, let him see. It is a very, very interesting spiritual dynamic when you start looking at what it is to have spiritual sight, spiritual ears, a heart that desires to understand, because the world doesn't get that. That's something that comes by the Holy Spirit. Verse 29, and Paul said, I would uh, to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. So, Paul here, he's nobody's fool. He, 
he, he wraps up his defense as he shares the great burden that he has for them to move from almost to altogether such as he is, a willing subject of the king of kings, obviously without the chains. Verse 30, and when he had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice uh, and those who sat with them. <laughs> this, this meeting's over. Uh, and when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death in chains. Uh, then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Interesting. In Acts 23, 11, uh, having been detained by the Romans, sitting in the Antonia Fortress on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, Jesus had appeared to Paul and said, For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And to Rome he would go. Chapter 27, verse 1, And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. Uh, now Festus, he could have waited. It was, this is in the, the late summer uh, of 59, probably August, and the weather would be turning very soon, uh, very dangerous on the Mediterranean Sea. He could have waited for a better time of year. He could have said, okay, Paul, you've been here for two years. We're going to have you winter here, and then we'll send you on to Rome after that. Uh, but we'll see now in verse 9, uh, Paul mentions a fast. That's the Day of Atonement. It was a reference to the Day of Atonement. That would be in October. So we know that things are getting dicey. Sailing on the Mediterranean would be, become much more dangerous, beginning about the middle of September, uh, treacherous to impossible by mid-November. After that, nobody sailed on the Mediterranean. The, the weather was just too rough. Too many ships had gone down, and it was just a known fact at that time that they did not go. However, <laughs> that's just decides to send him. Uh, and my guess is that after Paul had preached the gospel uh, so bluntly to Festus and Agrippa, and Festus, he's like, I want to get rid of this guy. Let's just, just go. He's going to Rome. Get him out of here. Rather than waiting until after the winter months, when travel would be safer, uh, he orders him and some other prisoners to be put on a ship right away. Now, also in verse 1, we see the we. Remember, Luke is with them, so that's a reference. Luke is writing this, but he's also with Paul. He's been with Paul throughout his time at Caesarea, and, and when he says we were put on a ship, he's with them. So, uh, also, another thing too, this guy Julius, I personally, I mean, he is a very kind-hearted man. It, it, interesting, in the New Testament, centurions usually were. They were really kind. They were very polite. Uh, and, and They had great power. They were, each centurion was over 100 men. So when we know, we see here that the centurion was given charge over him, he probably has a, a number. I don't know if he had 100. It doesn't say how many. But there were a number of soldiers under his command that would have gotten on the boat with them. So, uh, like I said, I, I really think we'll probably see him in heaven. Now, the Augustan Regiment, that's an interesting group. It was an elite group of Roman army uh, people, guys that they were thought to be official couriers uh, between Rome and the provinces. So, uh, it's similar to if you look at the U.S. Marshals Service, if you've got a guy that's under arrest for a federal crime and you need to get him from point A to point B, that's what these guys are doing. So uh, Julius here, with the men in his command, they pick Paul some other prisoners up, and they're getting uh, to the boat and start out towards Rome. Verse 2, so entering a ship of Adramidium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. Now, uh, an Adramidium ship, it was a small coastal ship that stopped at every port. Now, I was thinking about this. I remember when I was a kid, I used to travel to see my dad. I lived in the suburbs of Los Angeles. He lived out in Ventura County. It was only 80 miles away, but they would put me on a Greyhound bus. <laughs> that sucker stopped at every town. 
and what was, it was supposed to be, I mean, if my mom drove, it was an hour and a half. It took all day long. So I'm thinking, yeah, well, the Atromidian ship is probably like the Greyhound bus of the Mediterranean. They're going, <laughs> they stop every port along the way. Now, the home port of the ship uh, was the seaport city of Adramidia. Makes sense. And that was in Asia Minor. It was north of Ephesus and a little south of Troas, if you guys know your map there for uh, where they were located. Now, this guy Aristarchus that he talks about, he's a bit of a mysterious person in the New Testament. He does like these cameo appearances. He's like, he, his name just pops up. We don't know much about him at all other than he just pops up uh, throughout different letters and different accounts here, he, he pops up here uh, in Acts 27. Probably the same Aristarchus that, remember when we were studying earlier in the book of Acts that there was a riot in Ephesus and the mob seized a couple of guys. Well, one of them was Aristarchus uh, <laughs> and he was listed there as Paul's Macedonian travel companion. Uh, probably was one of the guys carrying the gift to Jerusalem. We don't know. We don't know if he was part of the group. We, we can assume that he was part of the group that came with him onto the boat. Uh, later on, he's referred to as a prisoner of Christ. Was he a prisoner then? We don't know. During his house arrest in Rome, Paul mentions this guy Aristarchus a couple of times in his letters. So uh, for what it's worth, like I said, uh, he just shows up, see a little cameo of him, don't know anything about him other than he evidently loved the Lord and he was a great help to Paul, and then he's gone. Verse 3, and the next day we landed at Sidon, uh, see here on the first slide, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. So if you notice here, we're going to just, well, I'll have this map up at various times throughout the rest of the study, and the green line will just show from where, where to where, and it'll, we'll see as they progress where they're going. So a short distance up the coast from Caesarea to Sidon, um, and again, Julius, he, he didn't have to. He could have said, Paul, you're confined to the ship. But he says, look, I know that you have people here. There's a church evidently in Sidon. He says, go. Go to them. And he receives, Paul, they minister to Paul. Verse 4, and when we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Now, under the shelter, or the shelter of is in italics. That means it was added for clarification. If we look at that literally, it says we sailed under Cyprus. That would give us the idea that they're sailing south of the island. It's not what it was. Luke is very well versed in nautical terms. And we'll see that as we go through this chapter. What, what he's saying, when we sailed under Cyprus, he's saying we sailed in the shadow of Cyprus on the leeward side of the island. There's a windward side on islands and there's a leeward side, calmer water. They went around the north of that under the shelter, of, and that's why that translation, that was added to the translation for clarification. They went around the north side of the island uh, because the winds were contrary. Uh, and, and they more or less hugged the coastline as they sailed uh, north of the island and along the bottom of Asia Minor there, which is now modern-day Turkey. Verse 5, and when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra. That's the second slide we have here. A city of Lycia. And there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. So Julius finds an Egyptian grain ship. We, that, just deriving, extrapolating from the rest of this chapter, we know what he found. Uh, all it says here is an Alexandrian ship, but we know that it's a grain ship, and we know it's from Egypt. And I want you to understand something. This is not a little sailing boat. <laughs> they were in a small boat, and now they're getting on board a ship. It's a big ship for its day. Probably over 200 feet long, had a displacement of over 1,200 tons. It's a big cargo ship, okay? They had them in that day. Uh, and these large, the heavy sailing ships carried a lot of grain. Uh, they came from the rich... Delta, the Nile River Delta is a huge area there in North, uh, North Africa uh, in northern part of Egypt. And Egypt supplied a lot of grain to different parts of the empire. And these ships were common in that day. Uh, and, it, you know, here the centurion, he's got these prisoners and there are other people accompanying them. 
And it probably seemed like a really good idea to get on a big ship here because they have to sail out over open water now in order to continue their journey to Rome. And you don't want to be in a little boat when you're, you don't want to be on the Greyhound bus there. You want to be on something that's substantial. So, uh, he's, he's making a, a good move. I mean, it's a logical move for him to do this, to get on this big ship. Verse 7, and when we had, uh, <laughs> and when he, we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty at Snidus, uh, the wind was not permitting us to proceed. We sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salmon. Now, this time they are under uh, the island of Crete. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens. That's the third slide we have here. And you can see the green light standing out. Now they're It's, in verse 9, it says, Now when much time had been spent, the sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. Uh, and Paul advised him, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo of the ship, but also our lives. So he makes reference to the fast. That means now it's not August anymore, it's October. And the weather has gotten rough, getting real rough out there. And so... Fall had arrived. <laughs> Dangerous to sail uh, out into the open waters as they had con- they intended to continue doing uh, because the weather could change really quickly. Remember the Mediterranean Sea, it's a huge sea and, and uh, very much like uh, if you think about the North Atlantic, we're going to look at the, the storm that came. It was essentially the same as what we look at as a nor'easter, massive storm that they're going to get stuck in. So the conditions that they were in, it spawned a conversation about whether to winter at Fair Havens or to try to find a more suitable harbor. Now, chances are there weren't any taverns at Fair Havens. It wasn't known as a harbor that you could stay the whole winter in. And I'm not going to get into the details, but as I was studying it out, there were winds, if 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 they had... Uh, a, north, a wind coming out of the northeast, they would be okay. But if the wind shifted and came from the south, they'd get blown all over the place. It wasn't an ideal place to winter the ship. So they have this debate. Now, while the debate's going on, Paul is really troubled in his spirit uh, as to what would happen if the ship left the harbor. So he's armed with this check from the whole, and I believe it was a check from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say that. But, you know, he, he's not a sailor. He's got a lot of experience being on ships, on boats. But he's saying, you know what? At very least, he's saying, this is not a good idea. <laughs> you don't want to set out. We're better off here at Fairhaven. I mean, think about the name, Fairhaven. <laughs> it would be a good place to stick around. Um, he repeatedly warned them. There were consequences ahead if they attempted to change locations. Verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority, thank God to that, <laughs> God got overruled on this, the majority advised to set sail from there also, but if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and northwest, that would be protecting them from the weather. Uh, they were, they wanted, their intention was if we could get to Crete, Phoenix, a, a harbor just down from where they were, uh, they could winter there. Now, verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, uh, they put out to sea and they sailed close by Crete. They stuck close to the shoreline. So, Essentially here, Paul's hearing from the Lord. I believe that. He doesn't have it all right because he, he thinks they're all going to die and they end up, he ends up getting clarification from the Lord later on that they don't and then they, they won't. But Paul's hearing from the Lord. The centurion is hearing from the majority. And these are skilled and experienced sailors, by the way. What they're saying makes sense. However, this is a great example, folks, of, there's a huge difference between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. 
There are times where the Lord has us go a direction that is totally contrary to man's wisdom. I remember I worked for a big corporation in Colorado back in 2017, and the call came to, to come and to pastor this church. My coworkers were upside down. They're like, what are you talking about? You got it made. You got the retirement, you got the 401 you got your management, all this stuff. And it was a good job. That was man's wisdom. But I knew, Stacy and I knew, that God was calling us here. And I praise God for it. Yeah, every day. I was telling somebody the other day, I pinch myself when I see what God is doing in our church. What a blessing. Uh, to be here. Anyway, so they ignore Paul's warning in an attempt to get to Phoenix. Uh, and uh, and it, they, they, sit, they get a brief break in the weather and they think, oh, you know, have you ever done that? It's like uh, somebody wrote us not too long ago about a piano. And I thought, oh, great, that's the Lord. I sent it off to Brian. He's go, man, our family wants a piano. He tells me later, it was a scam. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, you know, I got that one wrong. You know, it, 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 we'll talk about what it is when we have a prompting or a check from the Holy Spirit. We've got to be careful with that. But there are times where God is directing us and it is totally contrary to what makes sense to us. Now, we'll get into some of the parameters of that later on. So they get this brief break in the weather. And they go, hey, great, you know, there's our opportunity. We're getting out of here. So they put out to sea, verse 14. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called a Euroclidon. Uh, and, and people differ on how you pronounce that. We're going to go with Euroclidon. <laughs> Is it a Euroclidon or a Euroclidon? I don't know. Um, this is the part where if I had somebody with a fan and somebody with buckets of water, that we'd just spray you all down and get you like really into the groove with what we're doing here. But it's a compound Greek word that it, it breaks down like this. Euros, which is an easterly wind, with cludon, which is the surging of water, okay? Uh, so it's, it's this wind with a lot of water is what, what's being said here. That's why they called it that. So how tempestuous was Euroclidon? Now, the word tempestuous in Greek is an interesting word. The Greek word is tufonokis, tufonokis. yeah, I, I have trouble with these words. It's the English word. If rendered in English, it means typhoon. All right, this is a big storm. The same word would be called a hurricane in the Western Hemisphere. In the Eastern Hemisphere, a cyclone. Big storm, period. I mean, this is, not, this is the kind of storm that if you're out in it, you have to shout to be heard with the person sitting or standing next to you. I mean, your hair would be going sideways, your beard blowing off the side of your face. I mean, this is a big, dangerous storm, and they get stuck in it. Verse 15, so when the ship was caught and couldn't head into the wind, we let her drive. Now, I like that Luke, he must have been well-versed in nautical terms because he's using them here. And, and I, mean, I was telling my wife, I said, I had a lot of studying to do for this chapter. It's like, what does he mean he let her drive? I, I, okay, and so I, you know, I'm, I'm hitting the books. and I'm, Okay, this is what, what it means. is they, they took down the sails and they said, just let the wind blow it along. There's nothing we could do. Euroclidon caught the ship so suddenly, so violently, that they couldn't even turn the ship around and head into the wind without fear of capsizing. That's how bad this thing was, how quickly it came up. So they let it drive the ship to the southwest. And again, it's an east wind coming out of the, the, the northeast. And it was a nor'easter in, in the Mediterranean, and it's blowing them down. It's blowing them way off, out away from Crete, where they wanted to be, and out into open waters where the weather got worse because they no longer had the shelter of the island uh, to protect them. Verse 16, in running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, in the fourth slide we hear, have here, it's about 30 miles to the west of Fair Havens. We secured the skiff with difficulty. And when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship and fearing lest they should run aground on the Surtis Sands, they struck sail and so were driven. So the Surtis Sands, it was a long, on the north coast of Africa, long stretch of very sandy, shallow water 
that stretched out into the Mediterranean, and they're, they're fearful that they're going to be blown onto those, the stair to sands and the ship would break apart. So they're doing what they can to try to get, as, as they, they had no time, they're doing what they can to try to embrace the, the circumstances they're in and to try to get the ship as ready as possible for the storm. So they couldn't, as they get into the leeward side of Clauda, they're still out in the water because the, the, the island, it has real rocky shores all around, and it came up quickly from the deep. I mean, it, it's, a, a, it's basically a chunk of rock out in the Mediterranean. So they can't land there. The ship would get torn apart if they tried to do that. But the helmsman steers the ship into the calmer water uh, so that they can get a hold of the skip, which would be a rowboat. The big ships like this, they towed a rowboat behind them so they could go to and from shore if they had to anchor in the harbor. And in the violent waves, you can imagine that the rowboat probably was still being towed by the ship, but it sunk. <laughs> so since so they had a lot of trouble, but they were able to get to the rowboat and to hoist it up, to bail it out, hoist, hoist it up onto the deck of the ship so that they wouldn't be impaired by dragging this thing along behind them. As they cleared the island, the wind picked back up. Once again, they were forced to lower their sails and be driven by the winds. So I think it's really interesting here. What it had begun as a south wind blowing softly as they left Fairhavens was now a raging storm with no signs of letting up. In short, they're in trouble. Verse 18. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Um, Luke being part of that, he uses the, ter the term we. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. This is an intense time. These guys, they have no control over the ship. They get to the point, they say, you know what, we've got to lighten the load. We've got to get this thing floating as high in the water as we can. And so they throw the ship's tackle, probably one of the masts as well, overboard. Because what would happen with the mast, you got, even with the, the sails down, if the wind was so violent, and it was, it would put pressure, a huge amount of pressure on that mast, and it could begin to tear the ship apart below because that mast is a big lever. And so... As the wind is hitting that, they loosen one of the masts, they throw that into the sea, they throw all the rigging into the sea, that's the tackle. They're doing what they can just to save their own lives at this point. So, they lost hope. They said, we're going to die. And for, you know, we read this, and it's like, well, that's an interesting story. They're living it. Think about what that would be like to be on that ship. Days and days and days, this howling, fierce wind, the waves beating against the ship, no hope. You've gotten rid of the tackle, and, you, and it's like, you know what? Ships go down, and it looks like that's what's going to happen with this one. I'm reminded here of the term, God's work begins when I'm at the end of myself. I don't know about you, but I've noticed that that principle definitely applies in my life. When I come to the end of myself, when I say, Lord, I have no idea how this is going to work out. I give up. This, is, uh, this sucks. I just can't handle it. I don't know what to do. Isn't it amazing how God shows up? They had become hopeless, and God in his grace is about to give them hope once again. Verse 21, But after a long absence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. Now, they didn't abstain from food because there wasn't any. <laughs> they abstained from food because they were sick. I mean, they had been tempest-tossed, it says. They were violently seasick. They did not want anything to eat. <laughs> I, went out, I went fishing out of Bodega Bay one time, 
And I learned why they nicknamed that Blodega Bay. <laughs> I did nothing but hurl on the ocean the whole day. I mean, it was horrible. And, and I had taken Dramamine the night before. I mean, I always had this whole regimen I'd do when I'd go deep sea fishing. And, that, and it was like, I would look out, just looking out sideways, and the waves are like this. The ship, would, it was constantly in the trough. And the, I mean, it was, it was tempest tossed. I was never so glad. I wanted to kiss the ground when I got off that boat. So Paul says, I told you. <laughs> these guys, I mean, they're all seasick and worn out. <laughs> and, you know, on the surface, you might be thinking, okay, Mr. Smarty Pants, <laughs> thanks for the I told you so. That's great to hear, but right now we're kind of like in the process that we're going to die. But remember, God's in control of all of this. Paul's hearing from him. He's reminding them that he'd heard from the Lord to begin with. He's hearing from the Lord now. Here's a question for you. Have you ever gotten nervous when somebody tells you, I have good news, and I have bad news. Which would you like first? <laughs> That's usually a lead-in that I'm like, oh, kind of cringing. I don't know. What's gonna, what, what are you about to tell me? So here, Paul leads off with the good news. He, he, he's, and it's good. it really is good news. It's great news for everybody on board. Verse 22, now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong. I love that. An angel of the God to whom I belong. You want to know about God? Let me tell you about the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. Jesus had told them that. He knew that through the trial, and he appealed to Caesar, and now he's on the ship. Do you think that God's going to violate his word? He's saying, no, 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 no. You, you are going to see Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. So, Paul's saying, look, I'm a man of faith. This God that I serve has told me, he sent a messenger of, of, of his to, to tell me we're not going to die. That's the good news. <laughs> the God to whom I belong sent his angel. Nobody's going to die. Yay! <laughs> I mean, and I wonder how many of them believed and how many of them didn't because the ones that didn't were probably still feeling pretty deject dejected. And then he goes to the bad news. Verse 26, however, we must run aground on a certain island. Oh, great. That's just great, Paul. Can't your God just give us a nice cushy landing in some tropical port where we maybe lay out, catch some sun? <laughs> That's not going to happen. Not this time anyway. Verse 27, now when the 14th night had come and we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. Luke doesn't tell us how the sailors sensed they were coming near land. He doesn't say. Perhaps uh, the island's inhabited. Perhaps they saw distant fires on the shore. Perhaps there was an increase in seabirds because when you're out in the open ocean, you start getting near land, the birds definitely start stepping up. Uh, it could have been uh, that they had enough clarity that they saw a darkened land mass against the starry sky. I mean, I've been in the desert or in places where it's so dark, but I know that there's, there's a hill there because the stars stop and they kind of outline that. We don't know. But we do know that they sense somehow that they're getting near land. Uh, and now also when it talks about the Adriatic Sea, I don't want you to misunderstand. In our day, the Adriatic Sea is like off the east coast of Italy, between Italy and Greece, right? In their day, the Adriatic Sea, it was con considered to be the entire central region of the Mediterranean, okay? So don't, if you plug that into today's thinking, you think they're way north. They're not. They're still down below, and they're <laughs> essentially, as the map shows, kind of going in circles. They're getting pushed around up and down by the wind. 
verse 28, and they took their sound, they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they took soundings again, found it to be 15 fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. This would be a scary night. They get out, they drop four anchors. Now, they're still in 90 feet of water here. Uh, 15 fathoms is 90 feet. Uh, but the sharp increase or sharp decrease in the depth, what, that was alarming them. So they throw out these anchors. They're not necessarily trying to hit the bottom with these anchors. You know what a sea anchor is? It's where you drag an anchor behind a boat because it produces drag on the vessel. They do that with four of these things. They throw them out off the stern, off the back of the boat, trying to slow the, the ship down so that they can wait till daylight to see what they're up against. They don't know. They're literally flying blind at this point, doing what they can to try to control the ship. when they had let down the skiff into the sea under pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, that's the bow of the ship, the front of the ship. All the citizens from Syria and the soldiers are looking to save the ship. You cannot be saved. So these guys hatch a scheme. Hey, I know, we're going we're gonna to go put some anchors in the front now. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> you know, they, they're going to get together. They're going to lower the boat down to the sea and they're gone. And Paul, I don't know if he had an unction from the Spirit or if he was just savvy. <laughs> he's got to oh, wave, not so fast, guys. Yeah, he's got their number. Uh, and he says, you, you're not going to get away with that. So he goes to the centurion and the soldiers in verse 32, they cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall off. <laughs> That's it for the soldier's plan. <laughs> so anyway, verse 33 and as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them to all take food, saying, Today is the 14th day you've waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. It's been two weeks for these guys. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. God showed me. I'm standing by it. You need to eat. Why? starting to get light, two weeks without food. Paul knew these guys were weak. He also knew the angel had told him, look, you're going to go through a shipwreck. It's not going to be you just land in some cushy harbor. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And the guys need to have the strength to swim to shore. So uh, that's what's going on here. Uh, verse 35, and when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. A lot of people not part of his original group, understandably, but also the centurion, the soldiers, the prisoners, the people traveling with Paul, part of that 276 people. And in and, and thinking about that, most of these people had never met Paul. Many of them likely never even heard of him. Yet through these very difficult circumstances, God had been using this unlikely traveler to reach them. Verse 38, so when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. Does the microphone go out? Oh no, so good. They threw out the wheat into the sea. So remember, again, this is a cargo ship. It has a draft of 1,200 tons, right? It's heavy. Uh, now, the, when I talk about the draft, a draft, is, that's, it's the, from the water line of the ship to the bottom of the hull, which is the keel, all right? That's the amount of water that the, that's called the draft. That's how high the ship rides in the water. What they're trying to do here, look, the instructions they've been given, they're going to have to run this thing aground to be able to survive and so they're trying to get the ship out of the water as much as they can so that, number one, they don't have the force of the energy of all that weight. Number two, it's floating higher. They can get before they run aground. So this is very intentional, and there's, there's a design to it. That, that's why they're throwing all they You know what? Who cares about the cargo? We need to try to figure this out. So verse 39, and when it was day, they didn't recognize the land. Uh, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. So uh, 
the sun comes up, they look out, they don't know where they are, they have no idea where they're at, uh, and they decide to run the ship aground uh, on the beach. Now, we know, as we see in map, uh, the, the fifth map here, that the island of Malta was where they were, and uh, we're going to look at that next week. So I think it's interesting because in closing, from, again, from men's perspective, they were way off course. I mean, you look at the map and you see that they're just kind of zigging and zagging around out there. And, and this was definitely not happening the way that they had it planned. From God's perspective, the tempest had taken them right where he wanted them to be. And we'll see next week, God is going to use this. He's going to use the shipwreck. He's going to use the things that happened on the island of Malta to reach a lot of people. So with that, uh, we're going to stop there. And you know, This is like when you get right to the cliffhanger in a, in a good movie or a good TV show, and it says to be continued. Yeah, well, we're going to hang out a big to be continued here. They're still riding in this storm, and you're going to have to wait until next week to see what happens. Well, you can also read your Bible, which is always a good idea. As we wrap up, I want to look at a few things here. Uh, and just take some application out of this passage that we're looking at. The first thing I want to look at, I want to look at, you know, when, when Paul was there be before Festus and Agrippa and Bernice, as I mentioned, he flipped the script. He was actively looking for ways to do that. Uh, and, and folks, I want to tell you, the, the Great Commission, the ministry of reconciliation that each of us have been given, it's not just for some, all of us have been given the ministry of recon reconciling a lost world to Jesus Christ. It's all about taking people from the almost to the altogether. It's really, that's, that's as simple as you can get it. So with great spirit-led wisdom, Paul takes control at his trial. He ends up being the one who is leading Agrippa and Festus. I think it's fascinating how when you read the text, you see that he flips it around. In verse 29, he tells Agrippa, I would to God that not only you, but all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am. Now, we know that those two men rejected, at least in this moment. We don't know later on. We, I assume that they, they died rejecting Christ. But remember, our part is to look for opportunities to share the love of Christ with people. And I, I was talking to my grand or my son, talking about my granddaughter who is just, she's just on fire for the Lord. And he said, yeah, dad, she witnesses to her classmates at school all the time. And, and sometimes she uses words. Oh. And, and I just thought, you know, that's great. You know, let you be known by your godly lifestyle. Be known by, and she's known and she's loved. And she's being effective. She's looking for opportunities to flip the script. She's dealing with a bunch of teenage, mostly teenage girls, and she looks for ways that she can say, well, let me tell you about Jesus, or let me show you by my action how a godly person lives. That's bringing people from the almost to the altogether. We leave the results to him. Ours is to be a witness. Second thing I want to look at here is learn to listen. Learn to listen. Jesus described a central part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit as that he will lead you, lead me into all truth. That's what he says in the Gospel of John. Paul received a strong prompting, I believe, from the Holy Spirit with regard to not proceeding with the voyage, even though the ship's owner and the helmsman convinced the centurion and they wanted to. They went ahead. It reminds me of a proverb. In Proverbs 14, 12, we read, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end, of, but the end is the way of death. That was sure true with what happened here in this tempest, in this storm. So what do you mean that Paul had a prompting of the Holy Spirit? 
What are you talking about, Pastor? What is this prompting? I, and I could, we could spend a whole study and then some on this, but I'm just going to brush the surface a little bit. A prompting, it's like a flash of clarity in a person's spirit, in your heart. It creates an almost immediate knowing of which way to turn, what to do, what to say, or how to respond. It's an unction. The, 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 the King James calls it the unction of the Holy Spirit. So the other side of that, as much as the Holy Spirit prompts us to do or say certain things, he also prompts us not to act, not to speak. He often prompts us to avoid an aspect of temptation or sin. Learn to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It's usually, it's, it's, it's not, and sometimes it will go against what your brain is telling you. It did with me when I was in Colorado, like I shared. But, but I had a strong leading, a strong prompting from the Holy Spirit that this is where I needed to be. And, and every day we're faced with situations, we're faced with people, we're faced with, do I re- react in the flesh or do I respond in the Spirit? That's where the Spirit's prompting comes in. This is a daily thing. This isn't just big events. Learn to listen. Learn to not react. Learn to wait on the Lord. And and He will give you that flash of clarity, especially when you need it. I also want to caution, too, the Spirit will never prompt you in a way that's contrary to God's Word, ever. Ever. He doesn't do that. He doesn't contradict himself. He won't lead you in a way that's contrary to the love of God. He won't lead you or prompt you in a way that's contrary to God's love for people. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So, you know, you got to be careful because, you, and we can get it wrong. Uh, yeah, I think that Paul got it partly right when he said, hey, you know, if we proceed with this voyage, we're all, the ship is going to be lost and we're going to die. Well, the ship was lost, but God came to him later, clarified for him, said, you know, Paul, no, you're not going to, yeah, the ship's going down, but you're going to, but every person is going to be, be spared. So be open to getting it wrong. Be careful. Don't use that as a covering for your flesh, for goodness sake. Oh, well, God just told me to tell you. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is daily walking with the Lord, walking in God's wisdom instead of your own wisdom, walking in what you believe God is directing you in and, 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 and being willing to be corrected, to have a correction. Hope that makes sense. Lastly, I used to, my buddy and I uh, that I was able to spend time with in California uh, this last week um, used to lead teams of, of kids in New Mexico. We'd have 50 or 70, sometimes more, people that we would take down every year go on these Mexico short-term mission trips. And we called it a mission exposure trip because you know, they would be missionaries for two weeks <laughs> and then we were headed home. But one of the things that we would tell them when we would get the team together, we'd be on the ground in Mexico, we'd call a meeting. The first meeting is we'd teach them that they needed to be fat. <laughs> and especially the teenage girls like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? I need to be fat. Are you saying I'm fat? But it was an acronym and it meant to be flexible, adaptable, and teachable. And folks, we need to be fat. Our circumstances, sometimes they change in a moment of time. Just like that. We saw what happened. They, they, <laughs> times when we're experiencing a, a soft southern wind. Oh yeah, let's go. The next moment, a gale force typhoon. That's how it is with circumstances in our lives. It's critically important, and and this is something I I want you to get. We we don't teach feel-good Christianity around here. What I mean by that, yeah, God makes me feel good. (laughs) I'm not saying that we don't, and that we're just cranky Christians. That's, That's not it. But we don't teach a gospel that's like, 
health, wealth, and prosperity. That's just not part of it. It's not the New Testament. It's critically important, whether it's a soft southern wind or it's a gale force wind, that God is in them both. You got to get that. You got to understand that thing you're going through may not feel good. Do you think that God got up? He doesn't get up in the morning. Do you think he got up and he went, oh, they're in a storm? No. He knew what was going on. He was engineering circumstances for his glory. And as Brian mentioned last week, he is far less interested in how comfortable we are than what he wants to accomplish in our lives. Sometimes it's a big storm. Sometimes it's smooth sailing. Leave that to him. Understand he's in them both. Now, have you ever spoken to somebody that's in, in, in really tough circumstances there and they comment something like, God must be mad at me? because I'm in tough circumstances. I've spoken to many people over the years where that's respon- the, the response. Uh, some, sometimes somebody, maybe they've experienced a significant loss. They're angry with God. Uh, after my daughter went to heaven, I was dealing with people who were bereaved and, and there were people that either drew closer to God or people that were saying, oh, you know, he's just this mean ogre and then, you know, he doesn't care about me. And my job was to take them from the almost to the altogether in that. It's true that the circumstances that we go through at times are a chastisement. We're told in Hebrews chapter 12, the Lord chastens those whom he loves. And he, he goes on to say, the writer says in Hebrews, if you're not experiencing God's chastising hand at times, there's a good chance you don't belong to him. Because as children, that's how he trains us. So yeah, sometimes the circumstances are that. Sometimes, folks, it's no more complicated than, look, we live on a fallen world. We live in a sin-saturated society. We live on a, in a world that is hostile towards the church, hostile towards God, and sometimes that shows. Our enemy would love to convince us, if possible, that whatever we're going through, is, it's God's fault. God doesn't care. Or even worse, to begin to doubt that God even exists and that what you're experiencing is fate. You're on your own. Good luck with that. Not true. He's a liar. You know, with everything the Apostle Paul went through, over many years. And, and, you know, I could go into it, it, it where he talks about, you know, he, he had already written First and Second Corinthians when he's going through this, and he talks about there about being three times in the deep. This wasn't new to him. <laughs> he got through all kinds of crazy circumstances. But as he gained perspective in that. He gained understanding into God's ways through those things. And folks, God's ways are not our ways. They're beyond our finding out. But we do know that he's working it for good in our lives. That's what led him to to declare that through all the things he went through, he called it a momentary light affliction. It's like, are you serious, Paul? All of that? It's a momentary, it's 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 just this light little thing. It's like getting paddled for a minute. And your life was getting spread all over. They left for dead, shipwrecked you know, beat up, drug out of town. I mean, come on. Perspective. Sometimes it's a soft blowing wind. Sometimes it's a storm that we don't know if we're going to live through. And it really starts to kind of impinge on the amount of hope that we have. Question. We'll close. What are you going through? Perhaps things are good. It's a soft southern wind. You're just kind of cruising along. If so, praise God. Perhaps the storm is raging. It's really stressful or it just hurts. Learn to cry out to him in the storm. Learn to see him, to praise him. 
in both. Let's pray. Father, racing through this passage, looking at the tempest, looking at, at, at times tempests in our lives, looking at when people are stretched, stretched to the hope of despair, even hopelessness, that you are in control. Our hearts are grateful. We praise you that you, Lord, are at the helm in our lives. And, and Father, as we wrestle with things, we know that you're gracious, merciful, compassionate. I pray for each of us here, Father, those within the sound of my voice, perhaps online, that you would work through the circumstances in our lives, that we would see you in those circumstances and that we could learn to be people that rejoice in the storms and in the smooth seas. Lord, we're grateful that you have called us to be yours. We pray, Father, that you would use us in the lives of others around us, those in our sphere, that we could bring them from the almost to the altogether. We give ourselves afresh to you now and pray that you would do the work that only you can do in each of our hearts, that you'd find hearts that are yielded to you and to your divine hand in all that we're experiencing. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.